Next we have composition. And we see many of the same elements here in sculpture as we've dealt with in two-dimensional art. For example, line, form, color, mass, texture, balance, repetition. But some of them are going to be used differently. So let's look at some of those. So some of these elements include mass. Now, whereas in 2D, we were dealing with the illusion of mass, trying to create the illusion of three-dimensional space, of course, we actual, actually have mass with a sculpture. It actually has weight and actual size to it. And in terms of line and form, sculpture is going to be exactly the same as 2D art. But it does open us to a couple of new ideas. For example, open form and closed form. Now, open form directs the human eye out of the sculpture. So the artist is actually trying to guess out of the sculpture. Usually with something like this, we're going to start at the center of mass, and then our eye is going to move around. And of course, in this case, he's supposed to be holding, say, a javelin or something here. So everything is pointing us in one direction, so we're automatically going to start looking off this way and eventually leave the piece out the left arm. Now, why would you do that? Why would a sculptor want us to move to another piece or away from his piece? Well, this may be part of a larger sculpture, first of all. So there might be multiple pieces involved with this one. So maybe he's pointing us to another element in the composition. Second possibility is under certain circumstances, you want the viewer to be involved in the piece. So something like this makes us actually look across the room to see what might be there, what might he be looking at. And it gives us the idea that we're involved in the sculpture, that the enemy or the other person or whatever it might be could actually be in the room with us. So it draws us in on an emotional level under certain circumstances. Then we have closed form. And what closed form does is it keeps us in the piece. So as we move around, we're going to start roughly center of the center of mass here. And your eye is going to move around. And in this case, nothing lets you out of the piece. So for example here, I'm just sort of tracing where your eye might go. Your eye is going to kind of come back to the center. And you'll notice that I keep circling around and going to different elements within the sculpture. So the reason for this is the sculptor wants us to remain in the piece and figure out the story. In this case, this is David and Goliath. And by moving us around, he gets us to look at the sword, which is the method by which David removes Goliath's head. Here's Goliath's head, which we've come through as we moved down the arm and the sword. Here's the stones that we passed as we moved up the arm that were used to stun Goliath. So we're moving around these different elements, putting together the narrative. The longer you spend looking at the piece, the better you understand the artist's interpretation of this specific story. Then we have negative space. And these are openings or areas outside of the actual piece. And this piece is actually a bit of an illusion because it gives you the sense of negative space being positive space, etc. So negative space is all of that area that is shaped by the sculpture. Really, in terms of sculpture, almost anything else in the room becomes negative space or anything else in that outdoor space. So take the Statue of Liberty, for example. Obviously, we have negative space where there's a gap between her arm and her body or where she's holding up the torch. The area between her head and the torch becomes negative space. But also, in something that size, everything around it becomes negative space. So Ellis Island becomes negative space or New Jersey, which, if you've ever been there, you know that that's negative space. And that negative space can be manipulated and used for specific purpose. So it can help the artist get a message across. Can be almost more important than the sculpture itself. Then we have color. 
Now, in terms of color, color can come from the material that's being used to create the image. For example, paint, uh, or it can come from the stone or wood itself. So either way, uh, we get this sense of color. And most sculptures up until the Renaissance would have been painted, including those on Gothic cathedrals or the great ancient Greek sculptures that we're used to seeing in white, but in fact would have been brightly painted. And we have a lot of evidence of that. And those colors can affect the way that we read the sculpture. Is it colored realistically if it's a human form or is it something that is out there? You know, are we dealing with flesh tones or have they painted this person blue? That can give a great deal of information to our interpretation of a piece. And we have texture. Now texture becomes more important because it can convey emotion and movement. And texture uh, is a way to give movement to a sculpture that doesn't move. Of course, most bronze sculptures don't actually move. But what happens is if you place them outdoors, the texture will catch the movement of the sun and create that sense. It can also convey emotion. In this case, we're looking at figures that are going to their demise and we get that sense of sadness and grief just from the texture of the piece without even having to read into the faces and the expressions on them. And then we have proportion. This is the relationship of the shapes. And usually it's a relationship of shapes in terms of a specific ratio. In the West, the most common ratio is 1.618 to one. That's 1.618 to one. And that proportion is the human proportion. It's actually the proportion of the width of the head to the height of the head, or the width of an eye to the height of an eye, or the width of the nose to the height of the nose. These proportions continue throughout the human body. And it's the Greeks are usually credited with sort of discovering that. And that's where we get these proportions today. But those proportions can change. And they don't just apply to the human form. They apply to just about any form of sculpture. You can talk about proportion. But they do vary from society to society. The David on the left is, of course, sort of this perfect depiction of Western human proportions, this perfection of the human form. On the right is a specific idea from India of perfection of form once again, but in this case, it's perfection of spiritual form. And we'll see that the ratios are different. The waist, for example, is far narrower with the Buddha than it is with the David. So these ratios change from society to society and sometimes from style to style. 